Oh, I skipped the intro, but whatever. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're live. All right. Yes. Well, let me do the let me do the quick intro for the archaeology show. Welcome to the archaeology show. I believe this is episode ninety. If you're hearing the audio recording of this, and uh, I just want to put out right away, we are going to have a presentation uh, a little bit later by our special guest today, and the slides for that presentation, since you're obviously not going to be seeing the things that we're seeing on the screen are going to be in the show notes for this podcast at archpodnet.com uh, forward slash archaeology forward slash 90. So there they are. So, yeah. hey, welcome welcome to our first guest, I think, for the archaeology show. Yeah. Stuart Rathbone. Cool. Oh, you mean you call this archaeology? Because I feel like you've had oh, I'm plenty sorry. of guests. You call this archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're doing the live Facebook thing. So you you call this archaeology first first real guest, uh, Stuart Rathbone, yeah. and 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 also I guess your first guest for uh, Twitch and YouTube channel, right? Yeah, this is cool. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mute the Facebook side here because it sounds like we're working and and the audio's up and running. So cool. Anyway, Stuart, how's it going, man? Yeah, it's good, mate. It's good. Um, keeping busy, which is nice. Um, surprising, I suppose. <laughs> you're, yeah, one of the few you're keeping busy who... from a yeah you're keeping busy from a work standpoint your CRM firm is still so got you, have you guys doing things yeah we haven't closed down um, at all really um, everyone's working from home and we because we, of the, the work we've been working on we're still getting covered by the um, essential worker um, category Ooh, which is okay. really um an unusual position to be in. I've never been called essential before. <laughs> I have a letter, Chris. It's a it's a it's a formal letter that says I'm essential. Oh my! Ooh. Who who determined you were essential? Is that from your company or like the governor? The the the, the president of the firm. Oh my! <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, I wasn't aware that. I wasn't aware that individual companies could determine whether or not you were essential. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's legally binding, um, <laughs> but it looks that, you see. Yeah. Uh, no, well, it's because we do all that um, environmental remediation stuff, so that's the bit that's essential. Yeah. We're out in support gotcha. of that. We, we put it that way. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we're ticking along. Yeah. Well, just for for people listening to this in the future uh I, i've been pointing out the last month or so uh every podcast we record uh what the date is that we're recording because things are changing so quickly so we're recording this yeah. on april 26th uh 2020 so if the world has gone into apocalypse mode uh <laughs> in, a, in a week or so when this comes out on the uh on the archaeology podcast network or if you happen to be watching it on one of richie's resources in the future yeah then that's what's going on yeah, we are blissfully unaware of the future apocalypse that's going to happen, and we're in the current apocalypse of April 26th. So, there it is. God, you I know, was not the yesterday. Yeah, I'm a bit surprised with the. Um, you know, I'm a big sci-fi fan, and apocalypse was all supposed to be, <laughs> you know, Mad Max style, and we'd all be getting mohawks, and uh, the costume was going to be very, you know, sci-fi bondage gear, steampunk, that sort of thing, and it's turned out to be sweatpants. <laughs> Well, you know what's interesting? When I first started, when this whole thing first started, I was we were still I was still coming back from um, from that project we were on, and there was someone talking about um because he had been doing studies of all these preppers, and he was saying that the reason they don't believe that this is like the apocalypse is because all their apocalypse um scenarios are basically all personal fantasies, and the um the example he's using was someone who said that the apocalypse was going to happen and. There was going to be like an EMP pulse, and all the technology was going to end. So he was stocking up bicycles and bicycle parts. <laughs> that way he could still get around. And so that's the reason why you see all these protesters, you see all these preppers, because they don't believe this is the end. <laughs> right. Because it's all just a personal uh, fantasy. Which is, which is pretty crazy, because uh, this is the first incident in my lifetime where I've thought, you know, just because of the... I'm not a crazy doomsdayer. I'm not even a, really a conspiracy theorist. I don't get caught up in all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, but we made a Costco order the other day, and it got shipped yesterday, and I really considered that should we get the 25-pound bag of flour? 
Because, you know, <laughs> what, what if there's no flour in a couple months? <laughs> we didn't, incidentally. But it was the first time I ever thought, yeah, but should we? You know, should we get the big bag of flour? Should we get the big bag of rice? Should we, should we get some of the other, like, staples that aren't really going to go bad uh, just so we have it, you know? Well, you, you know, all, the, all the, the prepper materials, the dried, you know, the great big bags of dried beans that they've all been hauled in. Well, I'm still getting pizzas delivered, so, you know, good luck with that. Um, got a huge Chinese yesterday. It was fantastic, but good luck with those right. bags of beans. Oh, my God. I yeah. went to Roll Mountain Ice Cream the other day, and I was talking to the owner. It's like, man, you know, I bet you wish you had opened a pizza parlor by now. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, ice cream delivery is probably not so good of a thing right now. No. Although, yeah. you know what I was surprised by? Um, what was it? I tried the Rayleigh's e-cart like yesterday, mm -hmm. and it's only six bucks to have them deliver it to your place as long as you're willing to order like about four days out, <laughs> which isn't Not bad. Too bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they didn't like some stuff between the time I ordered it and the time that they dropped it off. Some stuff was already out. Because I think they only fulfill it on the day they ship out, which was really weird. Because it's like, then why do I have to order it so far out? But whatever. Yeah. So that's well, what we're thinking. Hey, it, it may be the apocalypse, but it's well catered and we're wearing comfortable clothes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, I was mentioning before we started uh, going live here that I've been doing a... The last day and a half, I've been doing a virtual search and rescue exercise with my Civil Air Patrol squadron. Actually, the whole entire Nevada wing. And... Ooh. It was actually really interesting and well run. We had up to 40 some odd people on a Zoom call at one time. And I ran the I ran a Zoom call for about 10 hours yesterday because I was yeah. the virtual base coordinator, basically making sure people had a place to come in, do briefings, things like that. But it was the most comfortable. We call it a SARX, search and rescue exercise. It was the most comfortable one I've ever done because I had my Civil Air Patrol shirt on and a pair of shorts. At one point, I had a nice drink with me as well, like I do now. I had a, a, an old-fashioned. My wife bought the stuff. She's been into making old fashions lately. And uh, I was like, it was fantastic. I didn't have to go into our headquarters, I, you know, it, wear uncomfortable clothes and sit there all day in a building without heat or air conditioning. And uh, I was like, this is fantastic. I, I don't want it to change. <laughs> and it was some of the best training we've ever done. So there you go. Oh, wait, really? Um, yeah, it really was because we had so many people involved. And a lot of times there's people that either just can't get away or can't get down Ooh. to the mission base. And, and we we often silo ourselves on these what we call wing-led exercises where each squadron is in its own place doing its own thing. And only a yeah. handful of people are really communicating at the squadron level, right? The wing level is communicating down to the squadron level, but the squadrons aren't really communicating because we don't have a really good, efficient way to do that. And yeah. But but this time, in this time, with a single virtual meeting location – Everybody yeah. was able to come in and, and, and really discuss everything in real time um, across the entire state. So, And I'm finding that with a lot of the different things I'm doing in this apocalypse time um, with clients, with uh, podcasts, with uh, yeah. pretty much everything I'm doing. It's like, it's like people all of a sudden discovered video conferencing in the last month and a half, <laughs> even though it's been around for a decade. You know, I mean, yeah, it's but like, it was where always was that. Um, it was always that cumbersome system where you had to dial in the right number and like everyone. Oh, my God. It's just like a big mess. Well, people figured it out real quick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, my God. I just hope we don't lose this. You know, I hope we don't lose this. So maybe anyway, you know, kind of like the way I don't think I want to go back to shopping in a grocery store because that was kind of scary yesterday <laughs> going to the grocery store, even with my mask. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. So, also, am I the only hey, person who like color coordinate, like you know, bought masks specifically to be, um, you know, color coordinated with their regular wardrobe? <laughs> yes. I don't think you are. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe here on this call. Yeah, I definitely haven't. I have one N95 mask I've just been wearing, but I don't go out that often. So, um, I've never even been able the... to figure out how to color coordinate between the clothes I'm wearing, Richie, let alone with accessories. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Hey, you know, before we go too far, uh, too much farther, Stuart, why don't you, uh, why don't you just tell us a little about your, a uh, little about your background? Because you're recording oh, from yeah. here in Reno, but you, uh, mm -hmm. you don't sound like you're from Reno. I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, so why, don't, like, what's your, what's your story? Um. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a English guy. Um, I've been in Reno for about five years now. 
Um, mm -hmm. I was an archaeologist over in England and Ireland for 15 years before coming here. Um, met a girl from the Midwest and she didn't like getting snowed on. Um, so we ended up in Reno. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't ever a, a, a long plan to move here, but it's, it's done us well. We like it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoy not getting rained on and she enjoys not getting snowed on. So works out. Well, that that's pretty much Reno in a nutshell right there. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Plus you must be enjoying your, um, your, um, what is that like a pool or is that more like a, um, sauna in back or a hot tub? Uh, the, the inflatable hot tub. That was my, um, birthday present, uh, for last year. And it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> little thing. Yeah. We actually, we've, we've got a garden for the first time. We bought a house when I moved over and we bought, um, I don't know. It, it's 40 foot by 60 foot of Reno weeds and uh, <laughs> just uh, and spiky weeds. So it took us four years to, to sort that out. But we, we started that just after Christmas and yeah. we've landscaped the whole yard now. So it's lovely. And, and we're getting to stay at home to enjoy it. So. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Mm. I, I feel like every time I go out biking, I see more and more people actually enjoying like their house or their apartment or whatever as opposed to when I used to go out biking along the same routes before and no one was ever enjoying any of that uh, I, I wouldn't want to be locked up in an apartment at the moment but uh, anyone with a <laughs> bit of space must be loving it <laughs> well yeah, you know. I'll go ahead Uh, well, you must be glad that you, you're out of the downtown apartment and in, into a house now, aren't you? <laughs> well, we're in a we're in a townhouse, um, so it's kind of an apartment. But we have a nice we have a nice patio in the back here. All the townhouses are kind of in a, I guess, a square rectangle shape, for lack of a better uh, way to say that, because it's not quite a rectangle. But in the in the back of our um, deck here, it's there's no like walking area. It's not like a courtyard with grass and stuff. So there's no people ever back there. Um, it's just the other, the other decks, I guess. But there's a big wall in between them, so you don't really actually see anyone. And there's a pond that has ducks and frogs in in the evening, and so it's really nice and somewhat tranquil. And the room I'm sitting in right now, uh, it's actually pretty cool because the the upstairs of this townhouse has two bedrooms, and the master bedroom is the one that has this kind of balcony that looks over that pond. And that's normally where people would put their bed and stuff. Um, but we actually put our bed in the smaller bedroom on the other end. Because, I mean, what do you do in there besides sleep and store your clothes? You know what I mean? So we took the mm -hmm. smaller bedroom for our actual bedroom. And the bigger room, we just call it the playroom, uh, for lack of a better word. We've got another TV. My desk is up here now. We've got a couch. Our Peloton bike is right there. All my wife's knitting supplies. It's just kind of a nice little kind of second living room, really, um, a space that we can use for doing different things. And it looks out on the pond, and it's uh, it's nice back here, nice and quiet. So not too bad. <laughs> I was just thinking this morning, we, we've got, you know, three bed house. So we've got the office in one, our bedroom in the other. And really, all we're doing with the other bedroom is storing a double bed in it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm starting to think, well, well you, you know, what? what's the point in that? Um, oh, you know, my. My, my feeling on guest rooms is really... Uh, you know, unless you unless you have guests a lot, and I, and by a lot I mean at least maybe like seven to ten times a year. If it's less than that, then I'm not going to keep a room for you all year long. Like I'll even pay for <laughs> mm -hmm. your hotel room. It's probably cheaper for me and better for my sanity if I could just use that room for something else. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Interesting. Like uh, if I had a third bedroom or I guess a second one, I'd probably just turn it into like <laughs> studio space. Well, that's mm -hmm. it. I mean. It it's it's a big enough room, it, but all it is, it's just storing a bed and some clothes. So I don't know. I'm, I'm mentioned that to Christina yet. <laughs> oh my god! You know what the crazy thing is? I've been looking at campers and trailers online, and I've been seeing these converted toy haulers that people converted into like half a camper, half like a space for um for an ATV. And I'm thinking, man, that'd be like a, instead of putting an ATV there, that'd be like perfect studio space for like doing videos. <laughs> You know, I just show up and like do a video and then wander around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nice, oh. nice. 
All right. Well, we're about uh, we're about 15 minutes into this um, on the recording side of things. So, uh, Stuart, you were going to give us a little bit of a presentation while we're while we're getting set up for that. Um, what what are you, what are you going to be talking about here for the next 20 30 minutes? So, um, this is a, a, a lecture I did earlier in the year up at the uh, SHA conference, the Historical Archaeology Conference in Boston. It was um, a lot of fun. There was a uh, a whole day-long session on linear landscapes uh, oh. organized by David Mather, of the, who works with the SHPO in Minnesota. Really nice guy. Um, yeah. And I've been working on the... Uh, I've been working on some sites up in Truckee on the, the Donna Pass and got very interested in the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. And part of that was just in my own time. Some of it is, is to do with actual surveys and, and excavations we've been doing but just understanding the whole story of that um has become a bit of a hobby and going out of the weekends and trying to find some of these sites that you're reading about and it, it's just been a nice excuse to go and explore that area Ooh. um and there was a call for papers went out saying oh we're doing a sem seminar on linear landscapes and i'm like ah, but i'm looking at a linear landscape um and so I did this presentation. So that's what it's going to be on. Um, and I think with a lot of, um, sorry, I'm getting a, a, I don't know how to turn off the notifications on my Facebook, but I have to say hello to Steve Quinn in Ireland, who's um, <laughs> making some frequent requests in drum and bass music, um, because <laughs> that's another thing. So hi, Steve. <laughs> um, nice, nice. So, um, like a lot of presentations that I do, do um, I think these calls for papers are really good to kind of focus you on, you know, you're, you're generally researching or thinking about a thing, and then you get an opportunity to, to develop it. And it, it's... So, um, what I'm presenting is, is what I've been thinking about as I've been exploring that landscape, but there was a lot of something resembling stratigraphy up there ah. and in that i mean there's all these linear features running through the, the valley and, and and up over the pass and they keep you know you'll see a bridge and it's crossing the river and it's crossing the railroad track so that's sort of a, a horizontal relationship and I, I i sort of started playing around with the idea of how do you organize and, and map those relationships out um so that's what the talk is on um, and and okay. yeah, I think I came up with something. It's kind of interesting, I think. Um, <laughs> well, why I mean, don't you uh, why don't you bring up your why don't you bring up your slides and and share your screen so people can see it. And while you're doing that, um, I'll mention again for the people listening to this on audio, um, the slides will be attached to the attached to this podcast. So arcpodnet.com forward slash archaeology forward slash uh, 90. If I got that wrong, the episode number, I'm pretty sure I don't, but uh, you can find it forward slash archaeology, and that's just the uh, the page for the archaeology show. So I'll have the slides up there. And also, Stuart, uh, perhaps you can you can tell people, unless it's in the beginning of your presentation here, because we, we mm -hmm. get a lot of listeners to the audio feed that maybe aren't archaeologists. That's who the, the audience is designed for. So what is a linear landscape? Again, if you define that in the show, you don't need to go over it now, but what's a linear landscape? Um, I think that was one of the things they were trying to work out on the day. There's, there's basically you're looking at either a natural route way um, or a river system, a pass through some mountains, uh, railway lines, canals, anything that's going to have an arrangement of related sites along some, it's sort of a concept of uh, travel um, and directionality running through some sort of linear feature. So it, yeah, okay. I, I don't know that it's a particularly well established term, um, and the, the the presentations that day were on all sorts of things from um, uh, aqueducts, long distance aqueducts bringing waters to mills, um, oh. canals in the the Great Lakes, uh, different railway lines, all sorts of stuff. So I think quite a broad term, but that definitely there's a, a directional. Um, aspect to it okay yeah. and, and you know I'll, I'll say 
Oh, go ahead, Richie. Yeah. I was going to say, interestingly enough, California actually has a form for that because <laughs> I had to read through one. <laughs> like all 20 <laughs> pages of it or whatever. Yep. <laughs> That's right. And and oh, I yeah. will say, uh, unlike a unlike a conference presentation, this is going to be a little bit different. So, you know, Stuart, you can just start giving your presentation. We'll flip through the slides here. Uh, now that Richie's got the video formatted on the uh, on the on the output here, <laughs> that's not <laughs> happening. Um, but if well. you've got any questions for Stuart, we're about thirty seconds behind on the Facebook feed, so we might get it to it a little late. But he can always pop back a slide, and um, we'll try to uh, we'll try to uh, interrupt Stuart and get those questions in route. Because why not? There's no need to save these all in towards the end. This is more of a mm -hmm. uh, more of a conversational discussion, and, and Richie may Richie and I may ask him questions as well. So if you've got something you want to ask Stuart, just let us know in the comments. Um, let us know in the comments if you're watching this on Facebook at ArcPodNet. Uh, sorry, Facebook.com forward slash ArcPodNet because that's where I'm paying attention to it. If you're yeah. watching this on YouTube or Twitch, then Richie will see it there and he will uh, present your comment forward. Oh yeah, I'm monitoring chat now. Okay. Awesome. So yeah. it, everything's visible and oh, working. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. looks good. Looks good. All right. Well, so the title of this for those that aren't in the um, local area, "Over the Hill" seems to be a, a local euphemism. I'm not sure if it's on just in <laughs> Reno or, or if it's the same in California or not. But it's this casual comment about driving across the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's like, oh yeah, no, what are you doing at the weekend? Oh, I'm driving over the hill. So we know what they mean. But it's a, a tremendous um, underestimate of what that journey actually involves. Um, and I think that's the little joke behind that comment. So, I, yeah, I'm Stuart, and I work for... Um, I must oh, there we go. I'm looking up at these mountains. <laughs> These uh, snowy images you can see is where that becomes a bit brutal because at any time in the winter, this, this area can dump six foot of snow overnight, no problem, and, and cause these horrendous conditions. And I suppose every winter, um, always some blizzard that catches a load of, of people out and they get stuck up there overnight. Okay, and uh, PowerPoint just closed on me. So that's fun. Oh. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. it's live. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hang on, um, let me get everything re re uh -huh. There we go. So, yeah, you know, you're always told to, to take your chains and blankets and food as you're doing this, this journey that. Which, in fairness, in modern conditions, should take about two hours, two and a half hours now um, to get over them, um, unless it goes horribly wrong. <laughs> and that's these days, by the way, because I know that back in the old days, like when the Donner Party was actually going through, there wasn't actually there wasn't really a real direct route. Like it was like a lot of crazy mm. mountain climbing <laughs> to get yeah, over. Yeah, I mean. The the engineering that's gone on to make that a, a simple modern route is is probably what got me most interested in it. Um, coming from an outside area, yeah. Um, because I mean, you, well, we'll we'll talk about it in a bit. But these these horrendous early journeys over there, um, and now we the, the, either by rail or by car you can get over, or you just fly over them. Um, and it, it's become a very easy journey, but as I say, it, it can still go horribly wrong. Oh yeah. So <laughs> there's. The... Mm -hmm. um, oh. Real quick, the slideshow's not not up again. Um, but while you're okay. while you're bringing that up, um, Chuck Hutchison on Facebook here is asking if you're talking about the Hastings route or going to or. If you oh. Know oh wait, no, like I the Hastings cutoff, that... right? That's further yeah. out in the state, isn't it? Yeah, that's um closer to um God, I want to say closer to Ely. Hmm. Yeah. I know because I think I was recording a site near there. Oh, hang on, let me. Oh, it's interesting trying to manage this and do. 
So I think the Hastings cut off is part of the, one of the routes that brings people into the Reno area or the Truckee Meadows area. Um, okay. On on that dropping out of Idaho and, and and coming diagonally across. Is my screen up and running now? Oh yeah, it's running. It is. Yep. Okay. Hang on, I've got to oh. move myself around. <laughs> there we go. So it, it, this is what we're talk, talking about is is the Donner Trail or the Donner Pass on a route over the Sierras, which connects to various of the emigrant trails. Ooh. We're going from Reno to Sacramento. That's the, the bit that, that, that crosses the mountains, and it's the the uh, terminus at either end, essentially. I mean, obviously, it's, it then continues from Reno, heading east, and ends up in Salt Lake or uh, Idaho, and from Sacramento, you're going to go over west to San Francisco. But this is this chunk with mountains in the way. You can see here um, the elevation change. I mean, Reno is quite a good elevation already, but we're yeah. talking about 2,500 feet in quite a short distance to get to Donner Pass and then this long uh, slope off back down into California. You can see a nice profile of it and how... Uh, how much steeper the eastern front of the, the hills are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> still steep dropping down into California, but but nothing quite like the Reno side or the I mean the whole yeah. eastern front. Um yeah. weird thing is if you ever look at the um the topography of the rail route, it's reversed. Oh. So that from the summit to Reno, if you see it the left hand side of that lower image is much yeah. gentler, and that's the engineering getting rid of that gradient. Oh. Um, so it's, 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 it's reversed on that image. That took me a minute to figure out. I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is heading west. You, you follow the, the Truckee River up into the hills um, as far as um, well, where the town of Truckee is now, and then the, the Truckee goes off to the south. Um, and, and runs into or runs out of rather uh, Lake Tahoe, a Tahoe city. But from that, that junction there, um, you go past Donner Lake, and then you hit the the, the the Donner Pass, and this just almost vertical wall of granite that shoots up a thousand foot. Mm. And I mean, what Richie was talking about earlier of how difficult it was. The, these are bits where they're having to dismantle. Yeah. Before all the, the work took place. Oof. So hmm. there's tons of stuff along this route. And I couldn't deal with all of it at the moment. Um, 40 Ooh. miles. So the eastern 40 miles of that 120, 130 mile route over to Sacramento. So. And a lot of what is focused on the creation road and to some extent the, the roads but there's not so much written on um the settlement pattern that that, that this route created and all the yeah. activities that happened along it and whilst individual sites and individual areas have been written about like when they're in terms of a system the opening of the, the train line and it gets running and then the books end. Um, so I wanted to see what effect uh, this opening this route had um, over a longer period. And this oh, is a neat is. slide. Um, yeah. This one's a, a NASA image. Um, what I like on this is you can actually see this one from space. Um, that row of lights running from Reno to Sacramento is all the little settlements and, and junctions of the freeway lit up at night. Um, and I'm, I don't know if that's important or not. I've just never had a study area that you can see from space. So I like it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Chuck Hutcherson mentions, um, was it four Washoe acorn roots from volume eight of the Indians of the United States. Is that like um, along the same route? I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I'd look it up, but my keyboard makes a lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I get for having yeah, a gaming I, keyboard. <laughs> I should confess, I'm not very good with the prehistoric and historic periods. 
Um, I've been since I've been here. I've been mostly focusing on historic archaeology. Uh, so my apologies. Mm -hmm. I can't answer that oh, yeah. question. Well, I feel uh, like, but... at least for me anyway, I feel like a lot of people like historics more in Reno than um, prehistoric. I might be wrong. <laughs> While the mining. Uh, and I, I do know the, I mean, the route was in use because the uh, the first wagon trains were led to it um, when they were talking to, uh, well, the, the, the chief that ends up being called Truckee. Um, and he... Ooh. That they, they meet him in the in the Truckee Meadows, and they say we want to get to, you know, over these hills. And he takes them up the route. He takes them up the, um, or he, he describes the way up the Truckee Canyon. So it's certainly a route that 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 was known about. And I think I uh, I've lost my PowerPoint again. Oh wait, really? Ah. Yeah. Frozen out. Still up oh, on dang. this side. Oh, it's frozen. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's just like um, it's just like being at a real conference then. <laughs> <laughs> just a laser pointer. All oh, right, okay. And of course, the um, only the only presentations that ever really work are the ones you don't really want to see. <laughs> right. <laughs> like the one I sat through, where um, was it? A Forest Service archaeologist was arguing that we should um, we should record and um, document tailings piles, even though you can't really tell <laughs> what period they're from. Oh, there we go. It's working again. Maybe. Let's see. Oh, interesting. God, they've got um a similar kind of um rail kind okay. of um thing near the um Hastings cutoff actually. Or yeah. Yeah. That's the it's like the markers to the west foundation. Um those oh, those yeah. ones are all put up. It's it, there's a really strange thing. The um a lot of this is it, the historical stuff to do with these routes is done by enthusiasts and local history groups, and there seems to be quite a history of competition um, between them and about accurately locating these routes. And some of the books can be quite aggressively written, dismissing right. other people's ideas and stuff. And of course, these, apart from a geographic constrictions, these trails were never—they're uh, not like roads, you know. They're not every wagon following one one set of cartwheels across open areas. Um, yeah. So they, those things are, are pretty neat. Interesting. What's so the wagon wheel? At, ah, that's um, at the old Reno Airport site, um, the old oh, airmail really? station, which is now a country club or a municipal park or something. Really? So that's to the mm. pioneers. Yeah, there's... Um, there's three monuments in a row. I might have a, another slide showing you the rest of them. It's um, it's not far from where I am. Um, oh, really? Is it on Arlington or something? Yeah. Oh, um, wait a second. Interesting. Huh. Oh, wait. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my so god, that's, that's the thing I keep. That's the thing I keep driving by and never stopping to look at. <laughs> well, shame on you, Richie. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, it's just like the videos I'm doing now. Like they're all around. Um, they're all about historical sites here in Midtown, and I'm like, wow, I didn't realize so many interesting things happened here. <laughs> yeah. Or that this was actually the edge of town, at one point. Of course. Cool. Interesting. Haha. <laughs> Yeah, there, lads. Uh, <laughs> yep, yep, we're here. Oh, yeah, we're still here. Cool. I think Stuart's having some connectivity issues a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. Nah. Well, I mean, yeah, but, you know, it happens. Hey, hey, Stuart, you can shut your video off. It might help your uh, presentation go through. Just while we're doing this part, and then we'll turn your video back on when we're done with that. Okay. Uh, I can I can stop your video too. I'll go ahead and do that. Oh, sure. Perfect. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh wow, that's cut yep. the latency a lot actually. Cool. Yeah, he's running two streams basically with his video and his uh, PowerPoint. So. Um, oh. Cut him off for a second. And if it gets if it's still bad, then we'll yep. we'll cut mine off too. <laughs> mm. 
but it, I don't know what people would do on this feed if they couldn't see my video. It's really the only reason they're here. So, you know. <laughs> All right. So if you get your PowerPoint back up and running. Are you? Mm -hmm. I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to repeat. Nice. Well, let's uh, – so I, I think this is uh, I think this is pretty interesting. There's been there's been a every every I, I heard this. What was it? It was a while back when I, I heard there was an author. I, I talked to him just a little bit because they were doing a book signing somewhere. I happened to be walking by and it was somebody that wrote a book about the uh, the Donner Party and the trip across Donner Pass. And, yeah. uh, you know, while I know the, the basics, I, of course, like like most stories, you don't really know the full story unless you really read a, an in-depth history about it. Yeah. But even so man just Stuart, you're right right in the beginning when you were talking about this it is it is amazing when you you don't just put your blinders on and you cross that interstate and you just go over from reno to sacramento sometimes that journey if you do it enough can just be routine and you're just like yeah you know richie you go to the bay area all the time you've probably been over the hill i mean hundreds of times and uh oh, yeah it's like but when you really open your eyes and you look at it and you think how in the hell did people do this like <laughs> Or there were highways. <laughs> like, what route? What route could they possibly have taken? How did they even make it? You know, it's just it's it's phenomenal to think when you're when you're coming across the Reno um, Truckee Meadows area, and you you've jumped you've just come across yeah. what you didn't realize was the only state in the future United States that has the most named mountain ranges. Um, one of the things in our uh, oh, wait, one really? of the things in our search and rescue training we were doing this weekend, somebody said. Nevada has over 500 named mountain ranges and many more unnamed mountain ranges, and it's more than any state in the union, including Alaska. And uh, wow. and you've you've just come or come over all those, but none of that was anything in comparison to what you're looking at facing the Sierra Nevadas. And I don't care where you're at, yeah. like anywhere along basically the Nevada side of the Sierra Nevadas, you're just looking at this wall of treachery and death. And usually, it's real nice where you're standing on the east side. It looks great. <laughs> the weather's beautiful. And you yeah. can just see the cloudy, stormy rockiness of that eastern front, that eastern face of the Sierra Nevadas. And, and well, to mm. say, well, it's not only that, but also, um, oh, well, no, there's not only that, but it's also the fact that that's what got the Donner Party because they came from the east coast and they assumed they had seen winter. But winter in the Sierras <laughs> is insane, like so much more insane than anything you'd ever see in the worst, like the worst blizzard in New York. Especially if yeah. you're actually trying to get over the mountain and down the other side before you die. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, perfect. Looks like you got your slideshow going again. No, I've just seen a spinny wheel. Oh, wait, really? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Because um, Winston I, I can't even see your play presentation. This oh, you can. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're seeing the whole, um, the whole. PowerPoint interface, but yeah, your presentation's going, and now it just went dead. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Okay, right. Oh, hang on. Let me. Uh -oh. Stuart, while you're uh, while you're getting that up and running, let me share something on my screen real quick. Um, because Chuck Hutchison sent over yeah. an image of what he was talking about, and uh, here it is. Um, these are the uh, the Acorn routes. Uh, for the wash show that I think he was talking about, and, you know, it literally means going to get acorns, you know, I mean, from, from living on the shores mm -hmm. of Lake Tahoe, it looks like, and then branching out across the Sierras um, and really following the rivers. It looks like um, this is a pretty, this is a pretty cool image. I'll try to zoom in a little bit here. Cool. Um, yeah. Oops. That's not working. There we go. <laughs> so this is Lake Tahoe, which means there's, there's Reno area right there. Yeah. And then looking at, uh, so it's not quite following what these acorn routes are because, let's see, there's the Yuba River, there's the Truckee, and um, little Donner Lake right there. So, you know, this would have been uh, this would have been Interstate 80 coming across here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because here's the Truckee River coming out, and the 80 follows that, so it would have followed right up along this way. But anyway, yeah, it's a pretty cool little map here um, showing these. Uh, Showing these different routes where they would go for supplies, especially oh, there's Markleyville. Yeah, yeah. Said no one ever. So there you go. <laughs> um. Oh, I just think about that because of Topaz Lake. Because you know, every time I go down 395, there's always that turnoff there. Yeah, actually, the drive up past Markleyville is pretty good. Uh, it's pretty nice. I like yeah. it. All right, I'll stop my share here. <laughs>
Oh, whoops. Thanks, thanks, Chuck, for that. That was pretty cool. Uh oh. Hang on. Let's see. You know, uh, there we go. Um, yeah, Amy's saying that's crazy. That's a lot of mountains. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty intense when you first come to Nevada and not only just drive through <laughs> it, but here, there are. It is uh, it is intense. It really is intense. And then uh, Eliza's asking, was the Donner Party the only travel train that got stuck there? Um, <laughs> well, they were the most famous, you know, at least. <laughs> well, yeah, and I think I mean they had some some high profile people on there. They had a lot of diary accounts. And, and of course, there was the cannibalism, which is how they really got famous. So I, I doubt yeah. they were the only party to get stuck in the wintertime um, going over the pass, but um, I, they might be the only ones that. Uh, I, I, I that think that. Other. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, that, that there are different routes crossing this thing, and the, the Donner yeah. Trail. Um... Yeah. And it's a reform, and it's too tough, and they just find better ways of getting across. And as it becomes more, mm -hmm. um, they're only the second party to try it. Ah. So as they they open up different routes to the north and to the south, and 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 this thing, you know, after three years, four years, it, it's really dead. Um, and of course, after what's happened, people are much more cautious about when they attempt the the journey. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can know. imagine. Uh, interesting. <laughs> so, Stuart, if your if your PowerPoint's going to keep on freezing up, maybe you can just uh, discuss some of the things that you guys talked you talked about in your uh, presentation. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So you get this this pattern, and you, you you've got the the Stevens Towns and Mur uh, Murphy Party, I think it is, are the first people across. Um, mm -hmm. and that opens up the, this journey uh, from the Midwest into California the Donner Party as we've been talking about follow them the next year um, and what they're doing at that time they're going straight up the Truckee Canyon um, and the lower canyon um, is just awful and it doesn't look it, it, it it's one of the most you know that, that whole drive is so spectacular and now you're on this sort of elevated heavily engineered road and you don't really see into the bottom of the canyon. But once you, if you look at the, the um, topography, it's, it, it, it's weird. The lower part of the canyon is much um, steeper sided. And it's just this V-shaped gouge where the river has cut through. Whereas once you get mm -hmm. about halfway up, it, it opens up and it's much broader and easier going. So that bottom of the canyon was just a nightmare because it's just rocks and this this river <laughs> um so the first thing the next year they the the they open up the dog valley canyon which um is the cut off of verdi and it loops up to the north and brings you mm -hmm. into the middle part of the journey um so they they stop that that's a lot easier going um and then there's a, a, a series of alternate routes uh, are made um, uh, at the, the 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 Donner Pass to avoid that. So you get Roller Pass opened up. Um, there's another one to the south there, but then they just abandon it altogether and start using the Carson route, which is a you know 20 30 miles to the south, and then you get other routes opening up to the um, the north as well. So this thing becomes kind of a an abandoned route, uh, and it doesn't uh -huh. become it doesn't come back to any prominence until the railroad um, goes through, and it's scouted out uh, by Theodore Judah um, in the eighteen early eighteen sixties. Um, he's he's uh, really he's, he's not one of the big four names that, that are associated with the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, wow. the, 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 the people that made all the money from it. He was the engineer who, who envisioned the project in the first place and got all the... He, he really worked himself to death to create this route. He's a very interesting guy. Yeah. And he was shown by one of the, the loggers he knew in the California side this particular route. And the reason they chose it is it's the only way through with only one summit. So as awful oh. as it is for mm. wagon trains, they can... They don't need to do two full sets of tunnels. 
Um, and that's where it's selected. So. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't even know that. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 there's only a single peak. Um, so you, that's why they picked it for the railroad. And so then they, they, they finally locked down this route. And there's been this big national debate about where the, um, the train would go. Um, <laughs> they select this one. So then the, the uh, Dutch flat to Donna Lake uh, wagon road is, is created. And that is an engineered... Uh, construction road that's going to allow them to um, create the railroad mm. but that in itself is tremendously successful because it's a, um, a toll road and they yeah. make a bloody <laughs> fortune because it they make it and then everyone wants to use it yeah uh, because it, it's substantially easier so you know the Carson Pass is opened up in 1848 Beckworth Pass um, is in 1851 Around 1862, I think 1863, the uh, the the wagon, the, the Don Dutch Lake, the Dutch Flat, Donna Lake wagon road is opened up, and that starts bringing people back after a sort of ten or twelve year absence. Yeah. And then they they build the railroad. They complete that. Um, 1868, that's opened. Oh, Dutch Flat, that wagon road is 1861. Yeah. Um, that brings a lot of people uh, back into the area. And you, at the same time, Truckee Meadows and the Reno side is developing into more of a, uh, I mean, it's not Reno yet, it, it, but it's, um, they're digging all these agricultural ditches and starting to drain the water off of the, uh, divert the water off of the Truckee to, to increase the agricultural potential on the Eastern front. So that's yeah. all going on. When the railroad opens up, I mean, it's an instant and massive success. <laughs> and it's involved so much, so many tunnels and, and bridges and fills and the, this horrendous death toll to, to create it, particularly mm. um, given the, the Chinese labor force, the, the, the hardest jobs to do because no one else would do them. Mm. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's got its dark side, but just as a feat of engineering, it is absolutely magnificent. And that, that changes things. One of the things that does is uh, it, it allows Reno to develop. I'm guessing, I, I would suggest strongly that there was always going to be a major settlement at some point on the along the eastern front of the Sierra. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you need but a bridge reason, before you go know, over the other side anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And whatever, you know, but we, it could have been Minden, it could have been Gardnerville, it could have been Carson, it could have been further up. Um, yeah, but all those towns suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, they suck because they didn't get the railroad. Um, <laughs> And, and and that railroad coming it, it, it that's why you can see this thing from space it it, it um it locks down the settlement pattern in, in the northern half of the state we become the destination and the gate through to the um through through to california and it's a weird thing locally that that reno doesn't um seem to identify itself strongly as a transport town but that's the only reason it's here Everyone says, oh, the divorce industry and the casinos and all of that. The yeah. reason Reno thrived is because the railway was, was picked there. I mean, Sparks yeah. Yeah. Was created it to service the railroad. And that's the third or fourth biggest town in the whole state, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this thing is massively important for, for what happens. And it, and it it has a huge impact on the settlement pattern in California as well. Everything yeah. feeds off of the, the Central Pacific. It's not so important anymore, but it's still a major freight route. So anyway, that's bringing people in. It creates the town of Truckee um, and, and, a, and a lot of the other settlements are all dating from this, this town, but you get this long period of um, activity now. Um, they start controlling the river, so the Tahoe Dam is first constructed in 1870. You get the first power station. I think this is fascinating, but you Truckee gets a hydroelectric power station in 1888. Then you get a series of four more power stations in the canyon. So at Farad, uh, Washoe, Fleisch, and the uh, Sierra Pacific one, which is at Mogul. Uh, those are built between 1901 and 1911. 1913, they remake the Tahoe Dam, which is the one that's there now. Um, if anyone ever gets to see the robot that operates the dam there, it's very cool. 
they have I think it's seven gates or thirteen gates. It used to be manually operated. They made this custom machine that goes along and still operates the manual gates, but now it's a, a little robot running on tracks. Very neat. Oh, cool. Um, wow. Yeah, well worth a look. Um, then, in 1913, the, the Lincoln Highway goes through the gap. Of course, again, once, it's, once this thing is established, everything is going to follow it. Now, the Lincoln Highway, major, major event in the, the nation's history... Oh, yeah. But of course, it didn't involve hardly any construction. It's just a system of signposts and, and way stations. There's, there's a little, very localized bits of road improvement, but it's not like the, a highway construction. Oh, that's true. I mean, I've definitely yeah. been up and down some, like, you know, backcountry sections of it near Eureka. Or was, mm -hmm. it, was it Ely? Well, whatever. <laughs> And yeah, well, if you've ever seen the old guidebooks, it's just a list of places to turn left or turn right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you get it to this corner road. of the John's Street, turn left, uh, <laughs> drive for 10 miles. Uh, see that red house on the right? That's it, swing a right there. You know, it, that's what the, the, the Lincoln Highway guides are, are like. Um, and then they're telling you, oh, you can stop there and get a beer. Um, <laughs> 1915, the transcontinental telephone line goes through there. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the uh, transcontinental telegraph was moved there. Um, it originally followed the Carston route, but it was moved uh, to the, the Central Pacific at the time of its construction. And that was actually part of the, um, the, the bill that was passed to create it. It was saying, oh, and we're going to run the telegraph through. The telephone goes through there, and you get that. Um, I forget now. I think it's Alexander Bell talking to the mayor of San Francisco through there, um, and the transcontinental airway follows it. So the the famous concrete beacon uh, arrows with the, the the rotating beacons on them, they're going to follow the route. Nineteen twenty two, the Victory Highway goes through there, and that's when you start getting proper road construction and we, we there's a fantastic bridge um, up at Donna Pass that, that dates from that the, the rainbow bridge up there um, well worth a look yeah um, we talk about the the, the CPR and I mentioned this earlier that all the books stop at the um, the end of the construction in 68 69 when it's open and running and all the books stop but that's really unrealistic the Central Pacific are bought out by the Union Pacific in 1901 and begin double tracking, which takes them 20, 25 years to complete. So mm -hmm. a whole nother set of tunnels and bridges are blasted through. So the the, the total number of, of major bits of engineering um, up there is, is you know doubled uh, over this period. Um, and it was that investment, because the, the big four that had run it really didn't invest in it once it had been created. That's an interesting story in itself. Um, mm -hmm. And I think when road transport really took off, I don't think the uh, railway would have survived if the Union Pacific hadn't have already invested so much time and money in updating it. I don't think it would have lasted. Mm -hmm. So um, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was one particular guy in charge of doing that, and it was kind of a visionary Bella, because that's why we've still got this resource now. I, I, I genuinely believe yeah. that. I mean, it is now, I think in the 80s, it went back to a single track um, for large stretches, but it, it just wouldn't have survived um, the middle of the 20th century. So the Victory Highway goes in, and then 1926, the US 40, which is like an upgrade oh. to Victory Highway, that goes through there. 64, I-80 goes in on a slightly different route. I mean, it the same linear landscape thing but it's whereas uh victory highway and us 40 kind of follow the line of the lincoln highway i80 is a bigger thing and it, it involves again all this suspended roads and um <laughs> again stunning bits of, of construction oh yeah i think i read somewhere that mm -hmm. the uh the time to get the i80 up donna pass the, the the length of the construction was the same as it took the railroad people a hundred years earlier because it's that bloody okay. difficult um yeah and all of this stuff is leaving buildings and um 
great big bits of engineering. You've got all the the, the wooden snow sheds. If, if anyone knows about those, but there was so much snowfall in the winter, they covered a lot of the track at, at, at the high Sierra with wooden snow sheds. But they were running steam trains, so they just kept burning down. They kept having to rebuild them. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually, they were replaced with concrete things, and you still see those now. Um, and then, uh, because of the opening up of the area, you get the early tourism. Um, the economy up there, uh, up until 1900, was really about logging, and they depleted the, the forest quite heavily by that stage. There's a lot of failed mining in the area. Um, they never did hit big. Um, they, all, they, they formed up several mining districts. But in 1900, um, there's a real push to, to open up Truckee and Tahoe for tourism. So you've got yeah. all these early hotels up there uh, still standing. There's some, some of them have been converted into really fabulous old people's condominium complexes and stuff. Some of them are still running this hotel. So it's just this yeah. tremendous amount of, of stuff. Um, different routes. That, sorry, someone. I was say, uh, uh, Stuart. Yeah, Stuart, hmm. you can probably uh, turn your video back on too. I forgot to mention that earlier, but because um, Richie actually has a cat representing you on the screen right now, I'm not sure. I prefer <laughs> that. <laughs> anyway, it probably looks better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, John Flood is uh, is watching us on uh, Facebook here, and he's got a couple comments. I'm gonna roll back to Don or Pass hmm. real quick because he had a pretty funny one here. He said he'd be mad. He said, I'd be mad if my party got stuck and we had to cannibalize each other, only to find out the pass was already named. <laughs> <laughs> like, right? And then he and then he mentioned referring to the uh referring to the railroad going across Nevada. He said double tracking is to be hard. It has to be hard getting supplies out while regular trains are trying to run east west, arguably as yeah. tough as the original laying of track. I can't even imagine that, especially in that area. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. When they did the double track, they, they I, I forget which way they wanted to run the trains, but once they'd completed it, they found they hadn't got the grades right, so oh. they had to change mm -hmm. them, and the trains actually ran in the opposite direction to what had been intended. Oh. Right. They, wow. But they did run, crucially, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, there's a, the, a little aside with these different um, organizations. You'll The Stevens, Townsend, Murphy party are the ones that first made the crossing. And E. Clampus Vitae, have I got that right, Chris? Oh, the E. Clampus, Clampus Vitus. Yeah, the Clampers. Vitus, yeah. 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 So they're the, the, the sort of historical mining drinking club or whatever they are. Um, <laughs> they started a campaign at some point to have it, the name changed back oh. to, so it's supposed to be the, the, the Donna Party, or the Donna Pass, it was gonna be the Stevens Murphy Townsend Party. And you can see some of the monuments they put up, up at the pass up by Rainbow Bridge. Yeah. So you can see the, 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 this. I don't know. They, these don't seem to be good things to argue about. But <laughs> Yeah, well, unless you're, like, drinking I, I a lot of beer. I don't want to get in a fight with the clampers, so I'll let them have that. Um, nice. One of the interesting things about the roads is they, they start cutting off and isolating areas, in particular... Um, US 40 and then I 80. It's brutal. If you ever try and get off the main road up there, you find this network. It, the, the whole canyon is really inaccessible because the roads have been cut through and they just don't get anywhere. Yeah. And there's always dead ends and then roads that have returned to sort of private ownership. So you're not allowed on them anymore. And that's um, created some archaeology of its own. So there's, there's different bits of, of these. Um, long stretches of asphalt road that don't have a, a start or a beginning, uh, particularly in the middle mm -hmm. of the canyon. Yeah. And uh, uh, there's some one fantastic, um, I wouldn't say fantastic, there <laughs> are some very extensive, what appear to be illegal um, dumping areas. Um, which you, you could, uh, I've got some photos of those and the size of them is, is pretty impressive. Um, yeah. It's not like can scatters. These are whole houses seem to have been demolished and pushed off the edge of these roads. Jeez. Cool. Uh, full of well, you know, cool to me at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> as far as littering goes, it's pretty spectacular. Um, <laughs> well, you know, gives us job security. 
<laughs> oh, good luck recording those. Um, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of bridges um, which uh, to do with the railroad and the, the, the roads, which are historical sites in their own right now because they're, they're, they're old enough. And, and mm-hmm. you know, the, that I haven't really looked at because it's a big it's a big enough issue that that would take a lot of time but trying to map out and understand all this stuff now i'm gonna i'm gonna have to try and um get back to sharing this video um all right the rest of this isn't gonna make sense yeah um (laughs) yeah if you get your uh if you get your powerpoint up go ahead and shut your um camera off but uh while while Stuart is doing that, oh, doing there that, there have been uh, there have been a number of people joining the call. Um, thanks for everybody on the Facebook side of things, where I can see. Um, John just left another comment. He said, "Were all the Western railroads built on standard gauge track?" He said, "I know that during the American Civil War, the North and South were laying different gauge. North laid the same, while the South had a hodgepodge. However, post-war, was everything going west standard gauge? Do you know anything about the railroad tracks out here?" Um, the, these big lines were standard gauge. Um, the logging stuff. Um, th- so there's the, the there's narrow gauge out to the mines, and there's narrow gauge out to the, the logging camps um, and mm-hmm. the bigger mines. Things like the the uh, Tonopah Goldfield Railroad get upgraded to standard gauge. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, these these because the, this had to connect to to Ogden and and, and wherever. So it. it it very much did. It was an extension of the existing Eastern Railroad network. Okay. Uh, Interesting. No, is, is, is my PowerPoint visible yet? Not yet. Uh, just <laughs> a black screen right now. Yeah. You are sharing, but uh, it's not the PowerPoint. Although it is interesting. Hmm. I mean, the railroad did bring a whole bunch of standardization, so I don't see why you wouldn't have standard, you know, standard gauges the whole way across. Like I know railroads are the reason we have time zones. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you you can't do it. But these these um, if you've ever seen the logging trains, I forget what they're called now, but they're they're quite different. Um, they have they they you should look them up. They they have a completely different arrangement of um, wheels because the oh. the the logging ra- railroads were so short lived that these things were just very quickly and simply laid, and they weren't graded in the same way that a, a main um, oh, a main train would be, and the the trains are designed that they can derail and be put back on the rails very quickly. So you know, yeah. for functional reasons, they they they're quite different. Oh, it's kind of hmm. like the reason why um all the mining carts um, you know, here in Nevada, I know it was super popular to just lay um like strips of metal right over planks of wood, or I don't know what mm-hmm. you call like blocks of wood, and that's why you hardly ever find tracks out here. Yeah, and the, the 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 logging roads are really crude like that as well. Yeah. Ha. Oh, hang on. Oh, good. Looks like you're getting we got it back. something. Hang on. Well, no, but still, um. <laughs> it's just not having it. Sadie. <sighs> yeah. See, this is why you should have gone with well... Apple. <laughs> uh... Oh, I did. <laughs> well, you know, you know, Stuart. Um, this is uh we're approaching an hour for this uh for this show anyway so let's talk All about right. um let's talk about some of your i mean what's what were some of your the conclusions of your research what are some of the things that you learned okay. uh, by doing well, this so the, the 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 point of the presentation and what you should be seeing now is what the question i was asking for this one was okay you've got i don't i, I hope i've given some impression of the the density um of the the amount of historic sites that are up there. And what do you do with that information? How do you make it usable? So the first thing right. people are going to say these days is, oh, well, use GIS. But GIS, that's... Have you ever noticed that GIS people are just think that GIS is the answer to everything? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's not. And the problem is you've got something that's 130 miles long. So at any sensible scale that you map that, you're going to have meters and meters of a linear map. And you can't yeah. shrink it down, because as you shrink it down, you can't see the detail. Of course. And just putting it in a digital version doesn't actually overcome that problem. But 
with a linear landscape, if you're looking at the patterning and the relationships between things, you don't need to maintain that east to west or the the the, um, the horizontal axis. So you can squish all this stuff together because there's lots of blank spaces between things, right? Yeah. So I was trying to think of a way of processing this information. And, and one of the things probably more common in archaeology uh, back in Europe is the Harris Matrix. Harris Matrix is a, a schematic drawing of your stratigraphic relationships. Oh, hang on. Oh. We use that for doing big urban excavations, typically. Um, or that's where they're most useful. So I got onto one of the British um, archaeology oh, so kind of like a, kind of like stratigraphy, you know, stratigraphy, basically. Yeah, yeah, and I, I say that there, there are all these relationships. The, the, they don't behave themselves particularly because sometimes the road is above the rail and sometimes it's it's under it, and depending on the topography and yeah. But there is this linkage. So that's what I got thinking about and i went on the badger forum british archaeological jobs resource which oh. is just very knowledgeable archaeologists hang out and i asked yeah. this question has anybody ever used a stratigraphic matrix for something as big as this and the consensus yeah. was that's quite interesting but it wouldn't work okay and a guy um chiz howard i think got hold of me um and provided some very useful information, which was about land use diagrams. And he was a, I don't think he's Ooh. in London anymore, but he was a, in London in the 90s. Um, and they they produced these, what they were calling land use diagrams, which are simplified, not exactly, they're not recording stratigraphy, they're recording a plot of land over time, and mapping out the different, like if there's a building there for this time span, and then it becomes a yard area, and then it becomes a garden, and then it becomes a building again. And so they're plotting out this sort of relationship between things in a schematic way. And that's exactly what I'd been struggling to, to do. So that was the key to it. And eventually, I produced this wonderfully colored diagram that you can't see. Oh, um, hang on a sec. Let's see. <laughs> hey, Richie, I sent you the PDF of this the other day. Can you try and... Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, hang on. Let's see. Hey, well, Just get that PDF while Richie's, that diagram. While Richie's doing that in the Facebook chat for this um, for this live show, and if I remember, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, although I probably won't, so just listen to this. But we interviewed Edward Harris, the inventor of the Harris Matrix, oh. at the Vancouver SAAs a few years ago, episode thirteen of the Archaeology Show, and I put that link in the uh, in the chat here. It's just archpodnet.com forward slash archaeology forward slash 13. He was a, a great guy to interview and very humble about the Harris Matrix and having it named after him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's, that, that it's a great tool. And, and that's yeah. what I was trying to work up was a, 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 a tool that would answer this problem. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, hang on. All right, Richie's got to do some configuration there oh yeah hang on well the weird thing is i'm not seeing the presentation over here but i'm seeing it on our... oh richie you're sharing it on a different way i gotcha yep yeah just make your face smaller <laughs> <laughs> don't worry it's away <laughs> okay there we go so um Stuart, if you're following along in facebook you can see it because he's not sharing it through zoom but he's putting it up on the display okay so I'll assume someone somewhere can see this. Um, oh, yeah. And what, so what we've got here is a, a, a schematic representation of that first 40 miles from Reno up as far as Troy. And you can see down the... So there is no scale from left to right here. None of that size matters. But mm -hmm. vertically, everything is, is by year. And you can see the different sorts of activity. So... Um, the red things are all the air mail route um, functions. The pink things are to do with tourism. Uh, the dark green is all the hydroelectric stuff. But what's also happening is you can see some um, thin horizontal lines going across, mostly mm -hmm. black. There's a couple of green ones and red ones. 
So those are the longer linear features. So down the bottom, you've yeah. got the original Donna Pass route, and then the next year, the Dog Valley route opening up, and you can see where the the original route diverges from the Dog Valley route. Above that, you see where the Dutch Flat Wagon Road goes in. Above that, you can go see where the Central Pacific goes through. And you can see the Central Pacific, how key it is, because almost all the activity starts immediately after that railroad is built. You can see all those other buildings and facilities have come in 1869, essentially, or 1868. And then going up, you get the different highways going through. Well, you see where US 40 goes, uh, in about 1926, you see all those light green bars uh, are stopping. So that's all the lumber companies and the ice companies closing. I don't know what the relationship is between US 40 being built. Why did that lead to the closure of the ice companies and so many of the mills? Hmm. Yeah. But the, the relationship is pretty clear. And above that, you can see where the canyon is really emptied out. There's very little in the middle trucky canyon now where it used to have all those things and that's oh. either side of US 40 if you look um you oh, they always say well it burnt down in 1926 and they didn't bother rebuilding it and blame it closing mm. on the fire but it's a western yeah. town. In fact, Verdo's hit by a big fire that year. But it's a western town. Western town always burned down. Of course. And it's they're like always rebuilt. Down a few times. But Verdo <laughs> doesn't particularly recover from that fire. Yeah. I mean, there's a great quote about Truckee being a, a long fire interspersed with periods of building. Um, so these, this, this is what the diagram is doing. It's bringing out some patterning. When Interstate 80 goes through, that kills off the rail of uh, the airmail route. You can see it lasts like three years longer. Ah. And maybe that's um, not a direct relationship there, but it's interesting. So that, that's what this thing is doing on a single page. It's showing you 40 mm -hmm. miles of relationships. And you can see some, some, some patterning in there. So I think it's a proving to be a really useful tool to examine this um, in a in an ab abstracted way, but in a useful way. Um, and the plan is just as a hobby, um, just to keep plugging away at this, um, filling in more and more detail, um, finding more of the sites and, and seeing what it, what, what picture can be built up. There's, um, you might see, if you look at the yellow line that's called Boca, um, underneath that, it says construction camp 17 and underneath Iceland, it says construction camp 20. So those are a whole series of construction camps for the railroad that I suspect are underlying almost all of the other activity because they're, they're developing specific areas for half a year, a year of occupation. And that involves creating some access routes, clearing away some of the boulders and the rocks. And then they're abandoned because they've finished building. Well, where are you going to build your ice company on top of one of those construction camps? Where are you going to build your um, the, the, the next train depot? Oh, well, we've already got this prepared area. So there's lots of linkages between these things. Um, and one of this, the things that the diagram is doing, for me anyway, is I know it, telling me where I've got holes um, <laughs> down in the bottom left um, past Truckee all that gap um, up until the 1920s that's filled with lumber mills but I haven't found the locations yet hmm. um, whereas the gap in the middle at the top of the diagram is a real gap so I, I think it's that's that was for my presentation essentially it's it's a useful tool for mapping out one of these linear resources, uh, looking at the patterning, finding where you've got holes in the information. Um, and yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and, and, and again, imagine that as a paper map. Not only would it be um, 10 meters long, uh, at a, say six inches of a mile, it would be huge. 
but you'd also need to Yeah, I think that this. I don't know. I, I I think it could prove a, prove a useful tool for other researchers. Um, this the the seminar is going to be published, so the, the paper will end up published in a couple of years' time. Um, and hopefully by then it'll be a bit more developed as a as a diagram. And I'd love to take this all the way over to Sacramento, but I don't think I can handle doing it. To, <laughs> the west part in california i think there'd just be too much stuff over there now um yeah but maybe to auburn or somewhere so we'll see all right well i think that uh we're running out of time for this so um you know we've gone gone quite a while but i like this format i like to be able to show a, a slide presentation like this and uh, to have you present this Stuart. and i will say there might be another place uh, there might be another place where you can present this um, virtually in in much the same way, but not on Facebook soon. And I will give you more details on that probably by the end of this week. So, um, and yeah, uh, we're just we're putting something together at the APN to kind of make up for the lack of conferences this year. So, um, okay. but more more details on that as we get it planned out. So everybody watch this space, and we'll definitely put an ad for it on a lot of the APN shows so people can can hear about it and, and find out about it. So um, I'll mention one last comment that uh, John just left here just now on the yeah. Facebook page. Um, he said, it's weird to hear US 40. He said, I live in here in Indiana. He's like, we archeologists need to work on how we study long linear travel corridors within historic scholarship, rail or road, especially between state lines and different ship offices and formats because, and, and I agree with him because it's like he yeah. said, Stuart, you know, study in the Sacramento side. I mean. Reno is uh, what downtown Reno is 13 miles from the border of California. So you don't even really start to climb an elevation until you're well into the California side. And it's uh, at least on interstate 80, you're well into the mountains, but on interstate 80, you know, it's a little ways in. And I mean, you really have to, most of what you studied there is in fact in the mm -hmm. California side. So bringing this all into, you know, across state lines for such a long linear resource is hugely important. Yeah, I think I, I, be interested once it's done and, and that is several years away um mm -hmm. is, is to hand it over to the shippo and, and other agencies and say here you go might be of some use here <laughs> um <laughs> there you go and so wow this well again thanks a lot Stuart. yeah yeah i think yeah, uh sorry. i think richie and i'll wrap it yeah no worries um i think richie and i'll wrap it up now so if you're watching this video uh, we had some of Stuart's slide presentation, but we had an issue with the presentation. So you can check out the <laughs> slides, though, um, at arcpodnet.com forward slash archaeology uh, forward slash 90 is the episode number uh, for yeah. the audio version of this. Uh, if you want to watch the video, you can watch it again here on Facebook. But of course, Richie has some places. Richie, go ahead. Yeah, you can also watch it on The Man in the Hat on Twitch and Happy Archaeology Fun Time on YouTube. And Richie's been putting out some great videos over on his YouTube channel as well. Go check those out. Some great archaeology stuff, some archaeo tourism yeah. type stuff, and some 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 really cool things he's got coming out. So uh, yeah. check those out as well. <laughs> cool. Wow. All right. This is just this has just been like a you know conference presentation, except we're all sober, or at least most of us are sober. <laughs> <laughs> and you couldn't see it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I think it's I think it's better because most conference presentations are fifteen to twenty minutes long, and they're probably running long to begin with. Um, in the in the symposium, you don't have any time because when the symposium's over, there's no time for questions, and you got to rush off to another one. So this discussion format for about an hour or so on a single topic has been uh, has been really great. So, um, oh, and, you're and a lot welcome, of good Amy. comments. <laughs> yep, Amy says thank you. Um, uh, member of the APN, just like Chuck Chuck is, and. Uh, uh, Anyway, thanks for thanks for the people watching too. I'm glad yeah. we had some engagement on this. This has been really fantastic. Oh, one thing I did want to mention is if anyone else wants to um wants to present their papers, like you know, I mean, we're always open. I feel like <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Contact us. Um, you can reach yeah. us through any of this, whatever your source you're watching this on. Just message that person, 
and you can yeah. uh, and you can comment us. My email address is Chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Richie, I don't know if you want to put yours out, but you've got oh, your, yeah. your it's, other um, resources. Oh, FPBVs. Eh, wait. Oh, God. I forget my um, forget my <laughs> happy archaeology fun time email. But whatever. You can just – it's always in the description <laughs> of my videos. You'll, like, you'll find all it. All my stuff is there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Cool. All right. Well, uh, again – Thanks, Stuart. Thanks for coming on. It's uh, it's a little weird that we had to do this on Zoom because we're all probably within about three miles of each other. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, that was fun anyway. Um, yeah. And thanks for having us. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And Richie, I would say uh, uh, take us out. Thanks, everybody, for watching.